Got it. Yes. At least it's honest.
bet it's safe. Sure, it's safe. I bet nothing could get in there. Oh, shit. I didn't think about that. What? I don't get it. Why is that so important? When this all went down, the safest place was that prison. It's designed to keep people in and keep people out. If I was a betting man, I'd say there's a bunch of convicts still in lockup. You think the guards just left them in there? Well, they wouldn't let them out, that's for sure. Probably left them in there to rot. Should we do something about it? <laughs> You're funny. This way's blocked. Any other ways through? Turn right two blocks up. Well, why not? You ain't thinking clearly, are you, Missy? Eastern Bay isn't full of white-collar criminals that cheated on their taxes. Those are hard criminals. I'd stay as far away from there as possible. Shit! Look at this! No way I can get through that. Hold on. Well, Bert, looks like we have no choice. What's that, darling? The only other route that we might be able to use... tell you something about that doesn't surprise me everybody's got their lockup story I was in the drunk tank once but that's in the military lockup a bit different a bit worse too I think Saul was trying to tell us a story not everything needs to be about Bert but I'm much more interesting so what did you do Larson I was young and stupid that's what they all say would you let him tell his story? Go on. I stole stuff from a store. Needed some money. I just turned 18 a few weeks before. The judge wanted to make an example out of me. So I spent close to a year in there. Bet you didn't do it again, did you? Bert, next word, and you are walking. Went home. Mom wasn't there anymore. She moved down south. Took everything I had left and enlisted. Took a lot of waivers for them to accept me, but... Since no one was signing up at the time, I got in. You didn't tell Michael that, did you? Nope. I haven't really told anyone that. Only you and... Well, him. Yeah. Oh, Louis Bert. Oh, can I talk now? Yeah, I'm not gonna say nothing. Back in my day, the judge would say, military or prison in their sentencing. Different war back then. Different soldiers, too. And once again, we're back to you. Oh, sorry about that. Truth be told, I don't have many people to tell my stories to. For quite a while now. Not since my wife Shirley died. You named your gun after your wife? Well, that way she's always with me. It was hers originally. I'll tell you what, that woman could shoot. What, um, what happened to her? Liver cancer. It only took a few weeks. Glad it went quick. Never touched a drop after that. It's only been me in this shop for the last six months, and... Don't have many that stick around and chat much anymore. So I'm sorry if I make everything about me. Just glad to have someone to listen for once. It's all right, I'm used to it. I'm a therapist, remember? Well, kind of. Uh, how can you be kind of a therapist? Well, see, now, I have the degrees and the diplomas on my wall at home. Just never had any patients. Say what? Well, of course, I had practice patients in college. Everyone has those. But afterwards, I never really applied it yet. I, I mean, I was going to. I just didn't have the chance yet. You weren't motivated to, or you just didn't have enough time to? Well, both. But I kind of wasn't really motivated to, to be honest. Why not? I, I didn't really care much for other people's problems. 
I realized that midway through my doctorate. Well, why didn't you just change majors then? It's hard to do that when your daddy's footing the bill. It was just easier to finish it up. So, what was your plan then? After all was said and done? That's just it. I didn't have one. Not before, not during, not after. Maybe that's why I ended up with Todd. He seemed to have one, even if it ended up being worthless. And yet you skated on your father's dime for your useless education just to throw it away. Kind of selfish, don't you think? Ah, uh, come on, Bert. No, he's right, but I want to change that now. I realized it after Todd. I don't want anyone to have to go through that. Glad we had this little conversation, but it's game time, people. Prison's up here on the left. I don't see anything. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Saul, roll down your window. It's quiet. Do you see anything? Nothing. Maybe they did get inside, or maybe the prisoners just starved to death. Should I keep? Yeah, keep driving. There's nothing here for us. Oh, it gives me the creeps. Just look at this place. It's worse on the inside. They modeled it after some old ones on the East Coast, brick by brick. Figured they'd make it look like hell. Then people would try to stay out. Some of the worst of the worst were sent here. Lady. No. No. I, I got her. Don't you pee on me. Can't you go any faster? I'm trying to see something. I'm trying to see what? There's nothing to see. Come on. All right. All right. I'm going. You, you didn't stay there, did you? For what he did? <laughs> That's a federal prison. Bet they stick you in some I think state. we're all past that now. Let's just focus on what we need to do. Not much further now. This is as close as we can get. You think we can ram the gate with this thing? I'm surprised we got as far as we did. Come on. Oh, thank you. No more rain. Is it all right to leave Lady in here? I'll follow you in the tanker. You can drive your lean green machine back with your precious dog. Lady, stay. What is this place? Angel says this is where some of the tankers load up from the refineries. They go from here to the stations. Okay, so what exactly are we looking for? We're looking for one of these to be full of diesel. I bet most of these are unleaded. This one's empty. Wait, wait, what's the difference? Are you serious? I'm sorry, but yes, I'm serious. Unleaded is used in most normal cars. Diesel is used for generators and big rigs and for trucks. Different type of fuel for different applications. But how can you tell the difference? Like, which tankers have which? Oh, my God. Very easy. See, diesel smells different. It's kind of oily, too. If you rub it on your fingers, it won't have a greasy texture. See, this here is unleaded. Not what we want. Or, you can just look at this label here that says, unleaded. Oh, uh, sure you could do that, too. I was just being thorough. Now she knows. Ugh. All of these are either unleaded or empty. Shit. Where's the fill point? Where's what? Do you see any spot that looks like it has a faucet pointing down? Somewhere where we can fill one of these up at. It'll be green for diesel. I can't see from up here. Hold on. Let me climb up. We have a path there. <laughs> Looks good. Go ahead and start her up. We were losing daylight quick. Bert was a little rusty backing up the tanker. 
We lost a little bit of time, but not enough to make me worried. I just didn't know how long it was going to take to fill it up. That's far enough. Liz, flip that switch over. Oh, shit. I hope this place has power. Here goes. <laughs> Finally, we're in luck for once. That sucks. More like game over. Warning. A few roadblocks and our prince is beating me around. You could, couldn't have siphoned this shit. Hey, Saul. Just walk away. I'll spare your lives. Just walk away. Yeah. <laughs> it does feel like that. I didn't even think about it. I don't get it. That, little lady, was one of my favorite movies. Road Warrior. Hey, Bert. You think we should trick this thing out with some barbed wire? Some crazy traps along the sides? Boys, in your movies, I just don't get it. What? You don't like movies? Like them? Yes. Enough to quote them? No. So what do we do now? Now, we wait. I have no idea how long it's gonna take to fill this thing up, either. Let's just hope it's soon, or losing daylight. About three quarters full, I think. <sighs> Said that 20 minutes ago, kid. Well, it's not like I have a dipstick to check. Do we really need to fill it up all the way? No, we don't. But do you really want to come back here anytime soon? Besides, it's easier to drive through when it's full. Otherwise, it's going to slosh around back there. It's a lot of weight we're moving around, and I'm not that good of a driver. And with that, and there goes the sun. How much longer? Maybe around 20 more minutes or so. Not too much longer. You got that whiskey from my house? That could burn off some time? Left it with your dog. Back at the gate. Don't be an idiot. I mean, you. Sober. You driving home to me? I was thinking we could stop off at a Motel 6 on the way home. Hmm, very funny. But I'm serious. So was I. Oh. No way am I gonna drive home in this thing at night. Why don't we just stay in the back of the big rig? On the tanker. There's enough space back there for one of us, and two seats up front for- Dibs on the back. Oh, you ass. That's the most comfortable spot. Why do you think I called it? I'm an old man. You can handle stopping in a chair much better than I could. Besides... Towards the front. Maybe it was an animal. Did you think of that? An animal with two feet? I know what I heard. I'm not that old. Ha! Stupid little shit. Thought he'd get the drop on me. You and your damn hand cannon, Bert. They heard that. This thing. Just drive. It's a straight shot out of here. We're gonna be all right. Okay, Jesus, that was fun. Lady. Shit. I, I gotta go get her. There's no time. It's all. You just stay in here, Missy. I I'm coming, girl. I'm coming. They're right behind you! Oh, shit. 
Chapter 5 Lady and the Tink Part 2 of 3 You and your damn hand cannon, Bert, they heard that. Hold position. This thing. Just drive. It's a straight shot out of here. We're gonna be all right. Sweet Jesus, that was fun. Lady. Shit. I, I gotta go get her. There's no time. So. You just stay in here, Missy. I I'm coming, girl. I'm coming. They're right behind you! Saul! Oh, He's trapped inside there! There's nothing we can do! Shut the door, quick! I'm not doing this again! I can't leave him behind! Shut that door now! It's the same thing that happened to Tom! But it's not happening to you! Now shut that door! He shouldn't have left us! He was safe in here! They'll get him! You hear that? They didn't get him yet! I know that boy, he ain't going down without a fight. Now come on, shut the door. There's nothing we can do for him right now. Hi. Name's Holly. It's nice to meet you. You interested in having a little fun? Does it involve a back room and a handful of singles? Not where I was headed with that, but I can see how you might have interpreted it that way. Enough. So, let me ask you something. Do you ever read comic books? We're not going back for it. You saw how many there were, and what those things did to that group of cars yesterday. I know Saul made that idea tough, but not that tough. Sorry, but I'm not real big on stories. Old comics are my absolute favorite. I think they cater to human aspiration. Distilling our best and worst human qualities and pitting them against each other in an entertaining conflict. The best ones show us pieces of ourselves and all the different heroes. And besides, superheroes are wicked cool. Is there a reason that you're bringing this up? I grew up in an old print shop where they had a stash of undelivered comics. All sorts of great characters, but my favorite was Holly Quinn. I first noticed Holly's comic because she had the same first name as me. But as I read more of her stories, it felt like we had a real connection. Why do you say that? Holly was a good person who got drawn into a dark lifestyle because she tried to fix someone she loved. Most girls can relate trying to change a guy who's never gonna change. There's something intense and passionate about being with someone who pulls you back in each time they hurt you. No matter how powerful and strong you are as a person, sometimes you lose control. Your obsession keeps you holding on for the crazy ride, lusting after the highs and waiting out the lows. Why are you telling me all of this? 
All I'm saying is that sometimes us girls can get a little, you know, overzealous. When we put our minds to it, we're way more devious, scheming, and vindictive than our male counterparts could ever be. And Harley Quinn is the epitome of that. She's an out-and-out -out crazy bitch. There's something you just want to applaud about a character so unashamed of her utterly disastrous mentality. She knows she's crazy, but she wholeheartedly embraces it and makes it work. She's a no-fucks-given, hot-pants-wearing, middle-finger to the rest of the world. Plus, she's fun. And who doesn't like a bit of fun? Where are you going with all this? I wanted to be just like Holly growing up. And part of that never went away. Lately, I've been trying to track down some of her gear. I found an old article in the Fallon's archives saying that before the war, Harley Quinn outfits were some of the most popular costumes for Halloween. I want to find one, and I think I know where to look. So give me the details. There was an old clothing store called Hot Topic down at the Monsinger Plaza. Legend is they were in the business of selling overpriced merchandise to teens who wanted a gothic or punk look. And if the Harley Quinn costume was as popular as I'm reading, maybe they've got an extra outfit or two lying around. So, where do I come in? I don't care much for traveling down to that area without backup. Place is crawling with raiders. And everyone else here thinks that chasing after an old costume is a waste of time. But you, I've got a feeling you might be different. So, what do you think? Will you come with me? If that's what floats your boat. All right then, we'll head out when you're ready. If Hot Topic doesn't have it, I know a couple other places we can look. Hi. What you need? That was all I had. If you say so. Follow me. Follow me.
Welcome back to The Better Man, tonight's installment of Pulpery Theater, starring the Narada Radio Company. When we left off, Yukon newcomer Chet Rand, having had a violent run-in with French-Canadian prospector Bully Lafitte, was being escorted by the townsfolk to Square Deal O'Brien's saloon, The Irish Rose. Our storyteller, the old-timer, is just about ready to... Well, how are you feeling, Mr. Old-timer? Are you okay to continue your story? Aces, daughter. Aces. Let me just wrap my whistle here. <coughs> ah. And now, let's see, where was it? Oh, yeah. Over at the Irish oh. Road. Oh. Yeah, I'm glad you're on our side. Feeling better from the brandy of Square Deal O'Brien and from the sweet-talking voice of Mademoiselle Rue Regret. Her French Shan Toozy. Word was going around about how Chet had stood up against Bully Lafitte. Even though he'd lost the fight, and folks were coming from all around town to see this Chichaco and try to prepare him for the next time he saw Lafitte. No, I don't see it. I don't carry a gun. I Listen, youngster. Listen, Chet. We're only concerned about how you protect yourself. A firearm of some kind is a natural deterrent against men like Bully Lafitte. You made yourself an enemy today, son, whether you like it or not. An enemy with a long memory who don't forgive and won't be satisfied until he's got even with you. Square, do you see my hands? Um, sure, son. What about them? I'll have to rely on them alone. You see, I don't want to offend you or anyone else, Mrs. O'Brien. But I'm honestly against all killing. I can't help it. I'm just made that way, I suppose. If I carried a gun, it would be sure to bring on a meeting sooner or later, for he'd think I was arming myself with that purpose in view. Also, if I did have a weapon, and he drew, I'd probably do the same myself, and one of us would get it. No, I'll take my chances. Well, suit yourself, son. Trouble with Lafitte is, he's not a fellow who comes out in the open. On Don't duty. forget. I won't. Move along, citizen. Nothing seemed to happen in the near future. Come on. Feet had stocked up heavily with supplies and had mushed on for a cabin he had on the Mackenzie. <laughs> 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 Bravo. Bravo. That was so lovely, Mademoiselle Rue. Oui? You like Piché? But that doesn't matter. I was moved by the sound of your voice. Can you tell me what the words meant? Ah, oui. I shall try. The song, it was of a young man. He gave up his health, his happiness, for his work. It is sad, no? I'll say. Why, that sounds so much like the life I was leading before I came here. You might have been singing about me and didn't even know it. Vraiment? Truly, chef. What did you do? I worked as a scientist, a, a botanist, really. The study of plants? I found it fascinating. Every moment I had, I spent on my research, trying to achieve my life's ambition, an exhaustive book on the subject I loved. 
It ended up exhausting me. A complete emotional and physical breakdown that landed me in a sanitarium for seven months. Quel horror! Oh shit, how terrible! The doctors told me to get away, to go to some absolutely strange environment for a year or so, and forget all about my cherished hobby. So here I am. <laughs> <laughs> I've been here nearly six weeks, and if the doctors saw me now, they'd say Sweet. I'm a perfect patient who obeys orders implicitly. We oui, shit, you are perfect. Well, that's not exactly what I meant. Say, Chet Rad, a plan didn't recognize you just now. Ain't seen you for a few weeks. Just look at you. Hell, son. I reckon in another couple of months, you can step in and plumb beat that Canuck to a pulp. They tell me you've taken on the most 15 pounds they do. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Oh, it is what I say. You are perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all thought about a month or so later that this thing between the two men might actually be put to the test. When Lafitte came into town to take a fling at the roulette wheel at Square O'Brien's Irish Roads, Bully had left his string of dogs with half breed John and walked across the street to the saloon. Chat Coming down the street a little while later, stopped when he recognized the husky he defended. And at the same time, the dog started up a joyful barking as he recognized his human champion. Well, look who's here. Hello, boy. I sure am glad to see you. Oh, good boy. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Oh. <laughs> hey. Oh, you're a good boy. Where's your master? Here I am. You think she's time for a try prove he's belong to you, monsieur? <sighs> no, Lafitte. I don't think it's quite time. Sorry. See you, boy. It took a heap of effort for young Chet to say those words and to walk away from the Canuck, but he knew his own limitations and realized he wasn't yet in fettle. And them, what had overheard what was said, didn't feel as if the younger man had evaded the <clears> issue, <throat> hey. more like he deferred it. Got a minute? Like a Need business. to get something off you? The next morning, Tell me about the That all depends. Eating breakfast with real regret at a table That's all for Irish now. This is. When Squirrel O'Brien came over to see him. I noticed you've away with dogs, son. What you got cooking? That big lead husky of Lafitte's is no kind of a gentle puppy with men, so it surprised me to see the affection he shows ye. Anyways, I mind me that my own string of dogs never take your presence amiss, and I was wondering if you'd care to take them for a bit of a run. Tis Saturday and me busiest time, and I can't get away. Well, I don't... There's an old running mate of the late Mr. O'Brien at Spruce Valley. Thirty-odd miles, maybe. And he's needing grub with a sick wife he can't leave. Would you like to do me the favor, Chet? Glad to. That is, if you think I can handle the dogs. I have no experience, but I've watched others do it. But, say... I don't want to be the cause of anything happening to you. Shush, shush, lad. I pride myself I can tell a man that has a way with dogs. And Squirrel Brian was right. The moment he stepped behind that sled, Chet Rand acted like he'd been born to the job of handling the string of huskies. He seemed to be able to get the greatest amount of effort out of the dogs with the least amount of work on his part. He learned to handle the long rawhide whip like a master. It soon became like an art to him. He could send it curling out to crackle within a fraction of an inch of the lead dog's ear, but without touching the animal. Square O'Brien was so pleased with Chet's work on that first run that she soon convinced him to start running a regular freight and express run to and from McLean's Pass, where the prospectors were sure to pay him high for such a service. Most of them fellers are too busy hunting for gold to think of other pursuits, 
so you're bound to have very little competition, and twill be a favor to me. Them dogs are getting lazy. <laughs> you're a lifesaver every way to me, Mrs. O'Brien. I'll do it. Time went by, and winter wore on, and Chet kept busy with his freight business. And he not only had a way with the dogs, he also had a way with the ladies. Square O'Brien started liking him as if he was her own son. And Mademoiselle Rue Regret, well, after that, there weren't no other men in her heart than Chet Ray. And knew that someday soon, things between them would come to a head. He was almost wishing that it wouldn't be too far away. Powerful though Snook was, Chet felt he could now hold his own hand and take it off. That way, he was in the best position he ever been. The chance to prove whether or not he was a better man than Bully Lafitte came before long. Toward the end of winter, it was, when the spring thaws were expected to begin any time, and the weather took it into its head to start playing pranks. Snow started falling, and ever-wise veteran in Square O'Brien Saloon soon predicted that it'd be one of the worst storms in years. I'm certainly glad I already did my run to Spruce Valley before it started falling. I'd hate to be outdoors on a night like tonight. You are not the only one, Shelly. I too am glad you are indoors. Hey. <laughs> Heavy storms will hey. always bring up memories of past storms. Well, I can remember the time we had that big old storm back in 1804. And the Irish roses, sparrow, and roulette tables lay deserted that night, while every old sourdough in the place swapped lies with each other. The yarns were flying back and forth at a rapid pace. Yet all the while, a real drama was making its way to them through the storm. Let me in! Let me in! Why, it's half-breed Jean. He's like to froze to death. Get him over to the fire. He's out there. About one mile. McKinsey Trail. Do dog. She are gone. Lost. Except the big one. The feet. He's almost gone. The feet. Uh, he's passed out shore. Rue, bring brandy. What did he say, boys? The feet's out there caught in the storm? Hold position. Ain't anybody gonna speak up? I know Bully Lafitte ain't the most popular gent in these parts, but he's human like the rest of us. <coughs> Hello, Jean. You just take it easy now. Easy, lad. Chet, what are you doing? Looks like it's up to me, Mrs. O'Brien. No, Cherie. You don't know that. No, You're nothing. gonna risk your life for a man who wouldn't if even... If anybody's going, like I'm going. He can't stop it. No, I don't want to. Thanks. But son... Suited up. Ever eyeball an Irish rose was on Chet and All right. Still in one piece. Steps to his room over the saloon. And after he was out of sight, a dozen arguments broke out over who was going to accompany him. Well, O'Brien and a few of the wiser sourdoughs exchanged knowing glances. These offers to go were real tributes to Chet Rand. He was back in a moment, pulling a parka over his head and examining his snowshoes. 
Squared, let me have a flask of brandy for when I find Lafitte. Sure, son. Rue, fill this up. Oui. Damn it, Chet. I ain't gonna let you make this trip alone. Thanks, Jim, but I've got to go alone. Well, I'll make it. Trail along if I'm not back in four or five hours, if you feel like it. So long, everybody. Look, son. It was them two words of Squirrel Brian that made Jim the traveler and everyone else quit their arguments. Why don't you people just leave us alone? You're listening to the Narada Radio Company's Polkri Theater presentation of Harold DiPolo's exciting tale, The Better Man. We'll be back with Act 3 of our play in just a moment. That's it. Hi, friends. This is Rinzi Korsetsov, one of the members of the Narada Radio Company, and I've been Just asked to introduce our newest sponsor, shot. Dr. Gumheel's Amazing Sausage Museum in hey, beautiful, historic Bumperson, Wyoming. Fight. At long last, Dr. Gumheel has opened the doors of his family home in Bumperson to display to the waiting public the results of a lifelong fascination with pork products. The Amazing Sausage Museum. Stroll down the oak paneled corridors of this fully restored 19th century Victorian mansion and view thousands upon thousands of samples of sausage collected over the course of several generations and passed down to the present Dr. Wrigley Eggleheel, who has continued the strange and fascinating hobby of his forebears. See actual samples of sausage served in the Theodore Roosevelt White House and other samples from as far back as the Ottoman Empire. Witness the lifelike diorama displaying the sausage making methods of Neanderthal man. Thrill to the pre recorded sounds of people eating links and patties in restaurants. Educate yourself and your family at the gorgeous full color wall chart that depicts every single variety of sausage ever made. So come early it. and stay late at Dr. Gumheel's Amazing Sausage Museum in historic Bumperson, Wyoming. Open seven days a week, closed on all Jewish holidays, no spots available in the gift shop. Welcome back to The Better Man, tonight's installment of Pulp Free Theater, starring the Narada Radio Company. When we left off, Chet Rand was just leaving the Irish Rose Saloon in a violent snowstorm to try to rescue his bitter enemy, Bully Defeat. Our friend, the old timer, is here to tell us more of the event. Go ahead. Thank you, Lars. This jug's getting low, so I guess I ought to wrap up my story pretty soon, huh? Ah. Uh. <laughs> well, I was telling you that Chet Rand set out to try and find that old Frenchman in the snow. He hinted that he'd be back in four or five hours' time. Well, now, to be exact, Chet made it back How many bullets? per feet across his shoulders and that big old hunter extended point on ahead of him tied on to his belt with a hunk of broken to shut his feet up onto a rug in front of the fire and handed the brandy flask to his trapper pal Jim. Pulling one of his big fur mittens off, Chet reached his hand down to the head of the dog who was staring up at the man with admiration. I guess you're mine now, boy. I guess you're mine now. Hey, y'all. Holy's coming soon. Why you look at me? Where is Lafitte? Come on, little I go, I go down. God, go down somehow. Do I don't know. I, I don't know. His leg, she just, uh, she just get too weak for the stand. She hard going out there. One dog go down, no there, no there. Except my strong devil on the lead. I don't know. I don't, I don't. Uh, Jean, what happened to Jean? Something go black for me. Your Jean came here. Thank you. 
for help. So, so, just get and then who will bring me a better man than you, Lafitte? Warmed up over here. There is no better man than George Lafitte. No man have ever knocked him down. No man have Don't ever used his that. gun so quick. <laughs> With those boastful words, Bully Lafitte had worked his way to a standing position, and his hand, as he finished, went to the heavy revolver hanging low in a holster at his thigh. He grinned in a scornful way at Chet, as if inviting him to argue. But it was Squirrel Brian who answered, and her voice was calm, as her own hand hovered cautiously over the little pistol. Won't be able to pick this. Pocket. He's proven himself a better man in every way, Lafitte. And I remind you what she said that day on the wharf last spring. And I claim the dog now. You killed over, and I didn't. I'd just come in from a run up to Spruce Valley, but I still had enough left to finish your own trip for you, with you on my back. <laughs> so... So she's put up job for to get husky, I no? By God, George Lafitte don't stand for those three key don't. Boy, why don't you be mad? All you talk about don't believe in God. Don't believe in problem? Earth, no, they're human being. Wanted to trade a few things with you. Let's see what I can spare. Me of all your talk. When I say I give you dog, when you prove better man, I mean Just a minute, Lafitte. Chet Rand stood a dozen paces away from Bully Lafitte and raised a I'm hand good for now. Thanks. Great. Go quiet. His voice was calm, but the muscles of his face were taut. And in his other hand, the lash of the coiled rawhide whip he held was nervously tapping against the high top of the leather boot. So you want a showdown, do you? Well, you'll get it, by God. Draw! Draw, you filthy hound! What? What? I said draw. Draw, you swine. I'm armed and I'm ready for you. Ah! Ha ha! Lafitte's right arm pitched down toward his thigh, but even as his fingers went to grip the blue steel nice. part of his weapon. Mondu! Like a striking snake, that rawhide lash in Chet's right hand flew across the room and bit into Lafitte's wrist. That was your chance, Lafitte, and I beat you to it. And I'm telling you again, I'm the better man. Better man, eh? By God, not while I got one more hand. Ah! Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ah! No, no, get off me, you dog. No, talk him off me. You gotta talk that dog. No, talk him off me. You gotta talk that dog off me. Talk him off me there. Break, break away there. Mm. That's got you now, boy. You don't want to bite him. You might catch something. <laughs> now, Lafitte, I'll just relieve you of this. And get up. Get on your feet.
The dog's quieted. Don't worry. All right. Like I told you before, Lafitte, Chet's proved himself a better man. And also, like I told you before, I remember what she said about the husky that day on the wharf. Follow me! I'm it upon myself to be the judge, which is to check fair and square and the dog. I've been ages since I've had this kind of fun. And another thing. Hmm? Out of this place with ye. Hmm? And on my word of honor, which ain't never been broken in this town, bully George Lafitte, I'm telling ye that if I ever do see ye trailing into this camp, it's meself that'll shoot ye down like the dog ye are. Now shoot! Yeah. 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 We'll be back to wrap things up with our story from the old-timer, right after this word. You're listening to Pulpery Theater, starring the Narada Radio Company. Hi, kids. This is Phil Boyd's Dodge. Back again to tell you about Tinky Winkles, the magic breakfast treat. Tinky Winkles ain't just your ordinary old cold cereal that you pour milk on and it turns to mush in your bowl. Heck no. Tinky Winkles are sweet clumps of oats, wheat, and bran that stay crunchy even in milk. Pour some in your bowl. Walk away for an hour. Go for a smoke or take a bath. And when you come back, that bowl of Tinky Winkles will still be just as crunchy as when you first poured it out. It's guaranteed. Now, we know a lot of other cereals make the same claim, that they stay crunchy in the milk. Well, all them other cereals can go piss in the rope. Pardon my French kids. Because Tinky Winkles, the only Tinky Winkles the Magic Breakfast Team, don't just claim it. They guarantee it. Pardon my French kids. Tinky Winkles, the magic oh, 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 In the bright blue milk carton, in your grocer's dairy case. Four out of Hold up a sec. Welcome back to our story of the untamed frontier, the better man. When we left off, Chet Rand had just proved himself the better man against the French-Canadian prospector, Bully Lafitte. Mr. Oldtimer, can you tell us the rest of the story?
Sure thing, daughter. Why, things got pretty hot up there for old Bull Eagle Feet, didn't they? And as far as I know, that Canuck never did show his face around that town again. Chet Rand explained soon enough why he wanted that dog so bad. And why he refused to engage in gunplay. I had to bring this thing to a showdown, you see. Because I surely did want this dog. I need him for a lead husky because I've decided that now that I'm physically on my feet again, I'm going to stick around this North Country and keep at this freight hauling game. Why, the place has gotten into my blood. And rightly has. And the people, too. You, Mrs. O'Brien, and Jim. And of course, Rue. Mon cher, I am so happy to hear you say that. That's fine, son. We'll be glad of it. To have you around. And, well, I didn't like to speak of it before, but I feel I owe it to you now to let you know why I've been so against using a gun. I, I took a year off from college back in 1917, and I got into the dust-up over across the water. I saw so much killing and so much blood that I told myself I wouldn't be responsible for any more bloodshed hey. unless I was forced into it by another war. I... I guess this old rawhide's good enough for me. Good enough is right, Chet. Good enough is right. <laughs> well, daughter, the bottle's empty and the story's all told. So I reckon I'll be hitting the trail. Well, thank you, Mr. Oldtimer, for coming to visit us and for such an exciting story of the untamed frontier. Will you come back and see us again sometime? Well, I reckon Hold I position. Might could, just as long as I got something nice to sip at, like today. Well, so long, daughter. Gotta be pushing on. Can't stand to be in one place too long. Thanks, and so long, Mr. Oldtimer. You have been listening to The Better Man, the seventh program of the Pulp Puri Theater series, starring the Narada Radio Company. Featured in the cast were, in order of appearance, Gene Giggy as the old timer, Matthew Willoughby as Chet Rand, Derek Lutz as Georges Bully Lafitte, Kevin Schuster, Michelle Cotter, Teddy Giggy, and Skeeter Ullman as Townsfolk, Jerry Eliff as Square Deal O'Brien, Catherine Crawford as Rue Regret, Juan Perez as the Prospector. Dana Gonzalez as Half-Breed Jean, and Micah Blaine as Jim the Trapper. Your announcer was Lisa Ayala. The Better Man was originally published as a short story by Harold DiPolo and appeared in the July 1932 issue of Thrilling Adventures magazine. It was adapted by Pete Lutz, who also directed and produced this program. Tune in again next time for another thrilling episode of Pulp Reed Theater. Additional voices provided by Derek Lutz as Seamus McWinkle, Catherine Crawford as Renzi Corsetson, hey. Darren McCormick Rockhold as the Zip Doodah announcer, Kian Lutz as the Tinky Winkles Kid, and Phil Boyd Studge as himself. Be sure to tune in next time when Pulpery Theater presents a tale of the jungle called Tame Me This Beast. The preceding production was sourced from materials in the public domain. The audio play itself was an original work and is the property of its creator. 
This production was pre-recorded and mixed at the Corpus Christi, Texas studios of 63 Audio. This is Pete Lutz reminding you that Potpourri Theater is your new source for the best in audio drama. This has been a 63 Audio production. Taken from the pages of magazines your grandfather used to hide from your grandmother, this is Pulpourri Theater, starring the Narada Radio Company. Hold up a sec. This is a tale of the jungle, that wild, savage land where nature holds sway. A land where men are either the hunter or, as so often happens in tales like these, the prey. Our story for tonight, Tame Me This Tree, was written by Robert Moore Williams. Mm -hmm. and it was the name of of Startling Stories Magazine. If you've been with us for our earlier episode of Pulp Blue Theater, You'll know that we are doing to bring the to You want to so I got it. Enter the realm of the supernatural. Told you tales of the average show. And treated you to a In the final four episodes remaining in this season, we plan to bring you such diverse fields as war stories, <coughs> sports, romance, and extreme. But our story for tonight is of the jungle. And we'll get started on that after this brief word. You're listening to Paul Theater, starring the Nevada Radio Company, on the air. Star intrepid reporter Phil Boyd Sudge out to interview a man who has a very strange yet real occupation. We'll let Phil Boyd tell you all about it. So, from Mount Rushmore, South Dakota, take it away, Phil Boyd Sudge. Dutch here, high atop Abraham Lincoln's hairline on Mount Rushmore, to speak with a man who has a very strange yet real occupation, a crack filler, here on America's most recognizable national monument, Mr. August Q. Kramheimer. Thank you for taking the time to speak to our Pulpery Theater audience. Uh, just call me Augie. Only my mother called me August, and she's been dead for 15 years. May I call you Phil? No. Augie, it seems that what you do here on Mount Rushmore is highly yes. dangerous work. Can you tell me how you became a crack filler? Well, Mr. Now, Sergeant, uh, I have been on duty. Uh, and Jefferson, Washington, and Roosevelt for nigh on 40 years. I inherited this job Come on. from my father, who did it himself from the time Mount Rushmore was finished in 1941 until the time of his sudden death in 1974. Moving out. And today, as you can see, I've got a few people with me who are going to be trying out to be my replacement. I'm not getting any younger, you see, and I'm so busy filling those cracks and fissures over the past 40 years that I never had the time to get married and have a son so he could take over. I see, uh... <laughs> Oh my gosh, one of your people just fell off the top of George Washington's head. Yeah, well, I told those dang kids to be careful. 
Welcome back to Tame Me This Beast, tonight's installment of Pulpery Theater, starring the Narada Radio Company. Ralph Kirkendall is our storyteller. He's laboratory assistant, hired gun, and general factotum to Professor Jerome Shaler, who has set up his own little science experiment on an otherwise uninhabited island not far from Borneo. Yes, it's just Ralph, the professor, and twin brothers Tom and Freddie who were members of the Dyak tribe of headhunters, but more about those two later. Kirkendall is no stranger to these islands, having experienced them firsthand while fighting the Japanese in the war. Listen now to Tame Me This Beast. I knew the Dayak native was a Muslim, so this insult of being called a pig and the son of a pig should have stung worse than the injury from the bone. I stood at a distance and watched the tall, muscle-bound black just stand there with an impassive face as the much smaller white man slashed and cut into his skin with the leather whip. Shaler's magic. Shaler, who had tamed the fierce black leopard to act like an overgrown house cat, was now a domesticating one who, not many months ago, had been a jungle wild man. A wild man whose chief occupation was taking and curing certain unusual, uh, trophies, which had given his tribe the name of Headhunters. I walked through the unlocked compound gate and approached Shaler and Tom. Before I knew it... Ah! Damn you, Shaler! Mm. Ooh! Well done, Kirky! What? Oh, you were using me as a control. 
I'm sorry. I reacted before I thought. <laughs> you did exactly what I wanted you to do. Here, help me up. Ugh. Kirky, it looks as if we have done what we set out to do. And what exactly is that? I don't know if you were too busy reacting to the whiplash to notice, but even as I was falling, I noticed that young Tom over there is still standing, exactly how and where he was standing before you knocked me down. That is, while I was lashing him. In a normal man, there would be some sign of satisfaction on his face that justice had been done, that his abuser had been punished. But look at his face. Just as impassive and indifferent as it was while he was being beaten. It's as if he thinks the common exchange of greetings between white men is for one to crack a whip against the other's arm and for the other to punch the first one in the jaw. <laughs> yes, indeed, I do believe we are making great strides in our research. Eh, I'm not certain how much we there is in that statement, Shaler. After all, you're the brains in this operation, and I'm... You're the brawn? This is gonna be fun! Perhaps, but I can afford to be generous in I couldn't have done this without you, Kirky. Your knowledge of this part of the world, not to mention your success, has been of great value to me. I'll take you with me. Professor Shayla's praise was appreciated, but I had a feeling that while nobody could do anything, anybody could have been by After all, I had my psychological problems, and while I was of above average intelligence, I was no super brain like Shayla. We'd come to the island together, used hired men to hack the clearing out of the jungle, and erect the Hudson compound. After the men had been sent home, Shayla got down to his real work. The twin Dyak brothers, Tom and Freddy, and the Black Leopard had been brought to the island of the and sold Shayla for the highest price the greasy little man had thought he could get. Go rest now, Tom. Go now. Get rest. I watched the Dyak shuffle slowly okay. away and contemplated Take the punishment the black had received. Standing in the hot sun in the middle of the country, the woodman was standing out with red streaks on his back. If Shayla was a headhunter into a man who would submit to the whip, then he could indeed work on it. I felt my heart quicken at the thought. I had already seen miracles on this island. That black woman rolling over onto his back in submission on the other side of this fence made me even more aware of the true nature of that miracle. Outside the compound was the jungle, Tom's native habitat. He could slip into that jungle and go back to his old life, fishing on the reefs, hunting in the green tangle that constantly threatened to overrun our little clearing. The point was, Tom did not choose to leave. Not even the whip could drive him away. I believe that Shayla must be using some kind of new drug of his own design, but I didn't know anything else. Whew. That wore me That out. was more than we bargained for. Let's go to my hut, Can't wait to try on the outfit. There are a few things I'd hey like there. to talk to you. That was more than we bargained sure for. Sure thing, I can always Can't wait to try on the Whoa. outfit. Got it right here. Enjoy. So, what do you think? Do I look fabulous His or what? getting better. Yours, not so much. What? His aim? That black devil will kill us. That's some serious Inside protection. Right ha now, ha. Vengeance on us Very funny. Here. You know that, don't you? So look, there's, probably there's on one Earth more thing I need to help with. Didn't quite feel comfortable telling you earlier, but my parents were well, murdered when I was a little girl. That must have been hard on you. How did you move past it? Spent most of my youth being raised by my aunt and uncle. They didn't exactly have the parenting gene. Made ends meet by running with a raider gang. When they weren't drunk or beating me, they were usually strung out on jet, psycho, or something worse. Only piece I found was reading those comic books. I'm sorry to hear that you suffered. One night, when I was falling asleep, a couple of guys barged through the front door with duct tape and knives. And well, you can probably guess. When I came to, 
I was locked up in a cage. Come to find out later. I can't even imagine having to go through something like that. And that was my life for the next several years. Until Murphy's gang rescued me and wiped out those slavers. Been running with them in Concord ever since. What happened after that? Once free, I returned to the print shop to retrieve my old comics. Found out that my aunt and uncle had long since moved out of that place. Spent a lot of time trying to track them down. And I think I finally found where they're holed up. You want revenge, don't you? I want to make them suffer like I did. And I want you to help me make it happen. I've spent my life savings on making this a success. And as you've seen, I've made a breakthrough. But I'm not done yet. All right. I'll do it. They camped out at a lake up north. I can mark the location on your pit boy. Let's head out when you're ready. If that is successful, next come. What are you looking at me for? You don't mean me. Uh-huh. But that wasn't part of our contract. I know it wasn't, and you don't have to participate if you don't wish to. I didn't mean you alone, I meant both of us. Oh. That was different. This was something that required a little thinking. Suddenly, a little voice whispered in the back of my mind, What's in it for me? We will have to test the response of several people conditioned by civilized life. Ah, here we are. Let's go in. There's the bottle, Turkey. Help yourself while I change my shirt. Taylor, tell me more about this plan. Why are you so hot to change the nature of people? We've Please been getting along pretty well without you for quite a while, you know. You are well, I'm happy to tell you, Kirky. But are you ready for a pretty sizable yarn? I'm game. All right. Make yourself comfortable, and I'll tell you a tale. Follow me. You're listening to the Narada Radio Company's Pulpery Theater presentation of Robert Moore Williams' thrilling jungle story, Tame Me This Beast. We'll be back with Act Two of our play in just a moment. Hello friends, this is Phil Boyd Studge, one of the members of the Narada Radio Company, and I'm back again today to tell you about the latest Vince Bargain, Ace Trambone, and the Well, I'm absolutely sure to find it this time, bringing you a deal to the Army Surplus. of Army Surplus potted meat. your language, fella. My engineer was indicating that I'm boring the crap out of him and I should move on, but he used a different word than crap. Hmph. <laughs> you just mind your mouth, fella. Anyway, He's already dead. Yeah. Well, I've learned my lesson from last time with those terrible smelling cans of Klein Dock vegetable cocktail juice, so I won't be opening any of these cans of potted meat for you today. Consider them for display purposes only, and just think, if you own a restaurant with a nostalgic theme, or just to decorate your home, how lovely and interesting these big five pound cans will look on shelves and counters, and in stacks on the floor in the baby's room. So that's approximately 15 cases of army surplus potted meat 
from the Spanish-American War era, now on sale at Crazy Crambone's Discount Warehouse in Sandusky, Ohio. Don't delay. I imagine some history buffs will be snapping these up in no time. Yeah, that's right. I told you to watch your mouth. Don't you talk to me that way on microphone. Oh. Welcome back to Tame Me This Beast, tonight's installment of Pulp Free Theater starring the Narada Radio Company. When we left off, Professor Shaler was getting ready to tell Ralph Kirkendall, his assistant and bodyguard, all about his plan to change the nature of man. It's sure to be a fascinating tale. So let's listen in, shall we? What I'm after here on this island is to domesticate Earth's last great wild animal. The dog, the horse, the pig, the elephant, the camel, and the cow were all domesticated in prehistoric times. But Earth's last wild beast has never been tamed. Man himself. Civilization has never done more than lay a thin veneer over him. Under this veneer, the great beast is always visible. Quick to resent a fancied wrong, hot to avenge it in blood. Quick to sniff out a bargain, <coughs> eager to buy hey, cheap and you the sell ones beer. that Hardy sent to drop Quick off to supplies to old main a knife, bank. a poison spear, or an atomic bomb, and rush forth to hunt his greatest enemy, his own kind. Here to help. You're late. Been waiting over an hour for Keep you guys talking. to show. Is everything okay? You I'll seem pretty tense. It's just... <laughs> It's not looking good for me. I'm not sure Her dementia's progressed up to stage six. What does that mean? The engine's running, but it's hard to tell if there's anyone behind the wheel. Her short-term memory's pretty much shot, and the delusions and anxiety are getting worse. Had to remind her who I was today. It's not something you're ever prepared for. And with Ben at stage seven, it just... It feels like we're losing hope. What are you going to do now, Doctor? Honestly? The I've got no idea. She's gonna need more frequent visits just to assist with everyday activities. We can well, provide them with professor. the care they need, not without more volunteers. Sort of but at the same time, we can't just abandon them, not after what they did to save us. What do you mean? What happened to you guys? Years back, a group of us were trapped in a house fire south of Medford. Figured we were goners, until Ben and May showed up out of nowhere and rescued us. We became good friends over the years, and started caring for them as their condition deteriorated. But there's not much more we can do for Ben at this point. At stage 7, he can't speak anymore, and the chems don't help with the symptoms once someone is that far gone. It's just about providing comfort Perhaps for him to the extent we're able. But in the you can never go wrong helping your friends and family. The male wolf is there anything I can do to help? Well, now that you mention it, if you'd be willing to keep them company for a bit, I've got an errand to run down south. I'm happy to help with anything I can. All right. I mean, if it's not too much trouble. It shouldn't be more than eight hours or so before Terence arrives for the next shift. Ben's asleep, so it's just a matter of keeping an eye on May. Head on in with the supplies, and thanks again. Isn't that what you used on Tom? On the Black Leopard? And now you propose to give it to me one of these days? Kirky, I do believe you're getting a bit drunk. Yes, if you must know, it's a drunk. Very subtle. We're testing it here to prove what the drug can do under the most difficult circumstances. Wild animals and headhunters are the perfect subjects, don't you agree? I hope when my tests are complete to see if we can introduce my drug into the to achieve the gradual lessening of the time. What? You want to put this stuff in the American water supply? Are you crazy? How can you hope to get away with it? Of course I hope to get away with it. I told you my drug works subtly and slowly. It might be years before somebody suspects that something has happened. And by that time, Earth will have become, again, another Eden. But we are not there yet, Kirky. So drink up and be happy, my friend. If you agree to go through with this testing with me, we shall check the results day by day and hour by hour. I don't want to make any mistakes, and I certainly do not wish to do you any harm. Well, what do I get out of it? I mean, get out of it. If nothing else, peace. A serene outlook. 
a freedom from the day-to-day -day hates and hostilities that arise in all of us, and which create the conflicts that warp us Hold from our position. future. Well, I'll have to think about it. You don't need an answer right away. Of course not. <sighs> I'll have to sleep on it. I'm going to my hut. I'll see you in the morning. I'd pretended to be drunker than I was, and then pretended to be sleepy, but the truth was I just wanted to get out of there and think on my own. On my way to my hut, I considered Shaler's words and felt fear creep over me. Supposing the experiment didn't work on me, and if it did, well, that little voice whispered, What's that for me? Again, in the back of my mind. You're listening company. to the Dorada Radio Company's Paul Perry Theater presentation of Robert Moore Williams's Thrilling Town. Can I get you something to drink? That wasn't the plan originally, but hey, tempting. It's been so long since we've had anyone come visit. What brings you here? Cut the shit, May. You know why I'm here. I'm sorry, dear. Do we know each other? After what you pulled, quit pretending you don't remember me! I do like your costume and makeup. Is it Halloween already? This is making me uncomfortable. Don't wuss out on me now. I've come way too far not to see this through. Dementia or not, they need to pay for what they've done. Hold on. Let's talk about this. At this point, you're either with me or against me. Make your choice. Would you like a cookie? I'd prefer a nice round of backgammon, but sure. <laughs> I suppose I'm game. Right. Make a joke. Time to end this. What's up? I'm good for now. Thanks. Later then. Hey. Thanks for your help. I know it wasn't easy. Hey, it's all right. Everyone's got a past. No need for an apology. I appreciate that, Puddin. I'm gonna head back home. If you ever want a partner in crime for the road, come find me. She shoots, yeah. she scores.
What's going on? Got a minute? What you thinking? Hmm. What else do you have? That all depends. Just curious what you're thinking. If you're good at something, never do it for free. Your thoughts? It ain't bragging if it's true. Your thoughts? I prefer to let my bat do the talking. Say what's on your mind. I may be twisted, but at least I make it interesting. What's on your mind? Sometimes the only way to stay sane is to go a little crazy. What are you thinking about? You know, I can help with those voices in your head. Tell me what's on your mind. I'm not interested in rehab. Tell me what's on your mind. Smile because it confuses people. Because it's easier than explaining what's killing you inside. Tell me what's on your mind. Can you really speed heal radiation sickness? Hey. What's up? Can I ask you something? What's going on? Tell me about the options. That all depends. I think I need to... Was it something I said? Well, hello. Uh, hey. Got a minute to chat? You lied to me. Care to explain? Look, about before, I don't really have a good excuse. There's not much for kids to do around here. Mostly, I was just bored. Will you forgive me? Don't you have anything to say in your defense? Hey, I didn't know you'd turn out to be cool. How about we start over? All right. But you'd better not make me regret this. Pinky swear. So look, I've got an experiment I need help with. It's up on the freeway. You interested? Do you have any more details? Well, Murphy wasn't listening to me earlier, so... Let's just say it involves a hostage and some C4. You want to check it out with me? Well, this should be interesting. I'm in. Okay then, I'll mark the location on your map. Let's head out when you're ready. Hi there. What's up? Let's trade some things. Sure.
That's all for now, thanks. Sure thing. Ahem. <laughs> Got a problem? I need to ask you something. What do you want? Hmm, what else do you Can I get you a drink? That's all for now. Well, it sure was nice chatting with you. Hey there. Something I can do for you? Let's trade some things. Let's see what I can spare. Got a minute? Go ahead. Tell me about the... Can I get you a drink? I think I need to run my mission solo for a while. Well, that's a damn shame. I'll be around. You know. Follow me. Not many people would offer help to strangers. Hey, what we discussed earlier. You're gonna be discreet with that info, right? I would never betray your trust like that. And don't, you know, this? Couldn't agree more. Can't think of it. And I, what? you need. Here comes my kind of trouble.
Hold up a sec. Hold up a sec. Hmm, getting late. Do my best work after dark anyway. Hi, how are you? Hi. Yes?
Hey, pal. So, what do you think? Pretty cool, huh? What's going on here? Blowing up cars is my favorite. I got tired of bugging Murphy about my mom, so a few of the ladies helped me out. We even rigged up a detonator. Ready to see all the parts go flying? It might help to talk about your troubles. I already know what you're gonna say. Same thing Murphy always says, but it's not like that. Are there any other options? Um, what could possibly be more fun than this? I'm not sure I want to do this now. I understand. How about you talk to the prisoner, and then decide? Excuse me. Hey there, friend. Preston Garvey, Commonwealth Minuteman. I know Preston Garvey. You aren't Preston Garvey. If that's really how you feel, that's straight up crazy. You calling me a liar? Maybe you made a mistake. I want to believe that. Any good gossip flying around? I've had word from a settlement that needs help. They're still hoping there are Minutemen out there somewhere. How did you end up in there? Have you heard of the Quincy Massacre? I was with Colonel Hollis's group. A mercenary group called the Gunners was attacking Quincy. I think you're confusing me with someone who gives a shit. What brought you out here? It's a long story. Look, you know my situation. You ready to help out? You're kidding, right? Come on, man. Don't blow me off. I had a more direct solution in mind. What's that supposed to mean? Here, I'll show you.
Hey, sweetie. So, how did it feel? Just a little bit of overkill? Yeah, maybe you're right. Anything else you want to take care of while we're here? I have some information you might want. If it's about Preston, I know that wasn't the real guy. Brina says there's at least one other imposter out there. But blowing them up made me feel better. And it wasn't really about the killing. What do you mean by that? It's about sending a message. I read that fear of death is even worse than death itself. So I recorded the execution onto a holotape. Someday, I'll make sure the real person gets a copy. I just want him to live in fear until someone can put him out of his misery. Who knows? Maybe it'll be you. If you say so. Anything else we're supposed to do here? Not that I know of. If it's all right, I'll keep tagging along with you for now. I can't wait to blow up some more stuff.
Is life always this hard? Or is it just when you're a kid? Hey.
Hey, pal. Hey there. Can I ask you something? Shoot. I think I need to... That's my cue, I guess. Uh-huh. Thanks for having me. Uh-huh. Peace, brother. Hey. Excuse me. What's up? What a day, huh? Everyone's welcome and good neighbor. Even me. Don't you have, like, important things to do? Nothing more to say. Nothing more to say. Uh-huh. I'll take a look, sure. Let's get you outfitted, killer.
Nothing more to say.
truth be told, I'm a reprogrammed Mr. Gutsy. I didn't always have this buttery English accent, or this shiny chrome exterior.